At the time this story takes place, I was 16 and my cousin was 12 years old. My cousin and I stayed at her house overnight and her parents had left earlier that morning to go skiing. I was supposed to stay with her until her parents got home later that night. We had pretty much been there all alone all day. In the afternoon though, one of my friends came over and drove us down to the store real quick to grab some junk food. We had made sure to lock up all of the doors when we left. Unfortunately, we forgot we didn't have a house key to get back inside. My cousin had to go around the back gate and climb in through the dog door into the garage, then go in through the kitchen to let me inside. It was a somewhat humorous experience. A few hours went by and it was now starting to get dark. We were sitting together on the couch watching TV when very suddenly I felt a nervous, anxious feeling just kind of wash over me. I didn't say anything about it at first, though. A few minutes passed by after I'd first felt it, when I noticed out of the corner of my eyes something down the hallway. I thought I had just seen a shadow moving. Perhaps a change in the lighting somehow. I was sure that something had just happened over there. Immediately, my cousin turned and looked at me and whispered in a frightened voice, Did you see that? My heart started racing right away. We slowly got up and walked straight across towards the kitchen telephone. Looking down that hallway as we got to the kitchen, I told her to call my mom right now. Meanwhile, I opened the garage door to let their dog inside, a huge German shepherd. As she was on the phone with my mother, the dog by my side, I felt more confident and started to slowly walk toward that hallway. There was only one other phone in that house, which was at the end of that hallway in her mother's room. While she and my mom were discussing on the phone, suddenly, another phone line picked up. She asked my cousin if I had picked up the other line. My cousin called out to me in the harshest whisper she could, asking if I picked up the other phone line. At that exact moment, the dog started to whimper and turned back and ran toward the kitchen. Needless to say, I became very frightened as well. My mom screamed at us to get out of the house. We both ran to the front door. I was looking back as I was fumbling to unlock the locks, just like in a scary movie. I just couldn't seem to get it opened. We were both in full-on panic and screaming. Finally, I was able to open the door. We scrambled out and ran down the road. It was a rural area without any real close neighbors. As we ran, I looked back in terror to see if someone was chasing us. There seemed to be no one behind me at all. In that horrifying moment of realization, I noticed that my cousin was not there. It was the worst feeling ever. I could hear her crying from inside the house. I knew I had to go back, I couldn't just leave her there, but I really did not want to. Completely out of breath now from running, I ran back, making weird sobbing sounds. I found that she had twisted her ankle and fallen off the porch in front of the house. The dog was laying next to her protectively. I walked up to her. She, the dog, and I walked part way down the road, still scared to death and crying uncontrollably. At this point, we saw my older brother's truck speeding by and screeched to a stop at her house. He told us my dad was on his way as well so we hopped in the truck with my brother and his girlfriend to wait for my dad. As we looked back toward the house, we could see a shadow walking through the living room. Every single person in the truck saw it as well. The curtains were closed, but the lights were still on. And somebody was just walking back and forth. Just then, my dad pulled up. He and my brother went in with a gun. They searched through the entire house, only to find that nobody was there. All the doors seemed to be locked as well, all except for the front door, which surely we would have seen someone walk out of. It made no sense at all. My brother and his girlfriend had seen the shadow too, so we knew it wasn't just me and my cousin hallucinating or something. But nobody was in the house. Another strange finding was that the phone that my cousin had dropped on the floor when we'd run out was now hung back up on the line. We'd never gone back inside. After that, we went home with my dad. We were too scared to stay inside the house. After that night as well, my cousin's mom stopped staying alone in the house too. If my uncle wasn't home for any reason, they would both leave. 
I don't know what other things happened there, but apparently that wasn't the only thing to cause her to make such drastic action. All of us decided to never actually speak about what happened that night again. It was about 3 a.m. or so. The fog outside the car was only slightly denser than the fog inside the vehicle. We were five teenage boys, stoned to the bone, curving slowly along a mountain road and enjoying the drive for obvious reasons. We had decided to take the scenic route. Keep in mind this road was already plenty scenic as it was. All we had decided was to co-sign ourselves to smoking more dope as we rode along. It also helped that there were less likely to be sheriffs along this isolated detour. Visibility started tanking at this point. The fog had thickened to such a viscosity it was like an endurance athlete ripping a bong at full power. The obscurity of our location, in tandem with the atmosphere, made all the immaturity of giddy wonder that much sweeter. The driver, Country, suggested we peruse the densely wooded riverbank along the road. Uh, okay. I don't think any of us were exceedingly pumped up about a half-baked walk in the night forest, but no one wanted to seem like a pansy in front of the others. The headlights kept on for visibility, warped the swirling mass of condensation, and threw eerie shadows into the trees. Everyone was too scared and just hung around the car, everyone too afraid to consider ending up beyond the range of the Mitsubishi's fog beams. I was the first one to defect. The river conjured up visions of a natural world almost too picturesque to belong outside a storybook, and my senses craved the sounds of that babbling brook. Suddenly, though, a commotion interrupted my brave advance. There was excitement in the voices of my friend, sure, but not the revelry you would expect to hear from a bunch of high teenagers. I could feel someone yanking me back toward the car. Even through the mental fog that obscured my thoughts, I felt the tug of an invisible hand. The boys were spaced across the vehicle in quadrants. Colin occupied the western brake light, through the eastern, country along the proximal headlight and Luis sidling along the distal. Behind the vehicle though, just barely visible through the thick mist. Uh, Colin, is that you back there? No, I'm right here, dude. If you're there, then who's that? Our screams all at once rose up. Someone was behind the car, a few feet away from my friends. This hooded man was standing there, unmoved even by our screams. This person stood stock still almost like a statue, the white of his face and hands barely visible through the mist. Even as we all dashed to get inside the vehicle, the man didn't move at all. His head did point downwards though, as if he was sad about us departing so swiftly. We peeled off forward, country gripping the wheel and turning corners with wild abandon. All the while, we tried to work out the details of what we had seen, trying to make sure that each of us hadn't been individually crazy. It sounded even crazier when we realized we'd all seen the guy. How had he even got there without all of us noticing? I'll never forget that feeling of something tugging me back toward the car as I came upon the river, leading me away and back toward the car. Was I just jumpy from the pot? Did we imagine this whole thing? Or was something more sinister telling me I needed to go back? Whether there was actually a hooded stranger stalking our car along that mountain road is something we'll never be sure of, but I can know the way they appeared was certainly not right. So this is a little bit of a weird story. I was on a school trip to Barcelona when I was around 17 or so. It was supposed to be a cultural trip, but for us it was just an excuse to drink all week with some friends. Well, one night we were particularly fucked up, and pretty much everyone had passed out. Me and a friend of mine, though, wanted to go explore Barcelona, 
and look for a bar or something to hang out at. At this point, it was already like 3 in the morning. It was not a great time for two teenagers to go out alone into the streets. Still though, we were dumb and drunk and thought it was a great idea at the time. After an hour of searching or so, we didn't find any open places. We had pretty much given up on going out altogether. In that moment, it seemed like a great idea to just end the night with some weed. And because Main Street was full of dealers at night, surely it wouldn't be a problem to find some. After around five minutes of stumbling around, we found a dealer in a red bandana who said he had some stuff to sell us. We walked with him to what he said was his house. We gave him 10 euros and he told us to wait outside for 10 minutes. We stayed on the ground and waited. After 10 minutes, we waited even longer. And after 25 minutes, we decided just a bit more. After 40 minutes though, we finally realized we'd been lifted. We were so furious. I mean, it was just 10 euros, but we were so drunk that was all we could think about in that moment. We thought the right thing to do was to ring that doorbell and give them a piece of our mind. We'd seen the man ringing the top doorbell, so we did the same thing. The door buzzed open almost immediately. We walked up like six floors until we reached the top floor finally. In that moment, I thought to myself, something's not right here. We could see through the open door at the top a bald shirtless man, tattooed from head to toe. The man asked us in a Hispanic accent, in a very aggressive manner, what we wanted. We tried to explain there was this guy with a red bandana who told us we could buy some weed there. The man kind of scowled and stared at us for what felt like 10 hours, then started to shout in anger. He punched me in my chest and kicked my friend in his back extremely hard. In that moment, we knew we'd fucked up. We started to frantically apologize and walk back down. As we turned around though, I saw there was now another man standing behind us with an enormous pit bull by his side. We started to creep past him a little faster and both him and the bald man started to follow us down. We had a bit of a head start though, so we were ahead. Halfway down when I thought we'd be able to make it, another door opened. Two men emerged with baseball bats. They burst out and began to smack us really hard. Luckily, we were able to keep our footing. We started to run even faster. We were really sprinting at this point. When we finally got to the bottom floor, we tackled the door open and began to run and scream for the police. The men continued to chase after us for another 50 meters or so. Then they stopped and watched us before finally walking back. If we had been just a bit slower, this story could have ended a whole nother way. Now though, it's just a really good and kind of funny story, which I'll never forget. I like to take walks around my neighborhood at night to get a break from all the arguing at home with my family when I was a teenager. It normally wasn't that much of a problem, because my particular area shut down after 10 p.m. and barely anyone drove through either, let alone walked around past a certain time. I slapped in my headphones and started my walk. I took my usual route, then began to go back home after I'd completed a lap around the area. All of a sudden though, I got this huge feeling that something was not right. I spun around in a way I tried to make look as natural as possible as a car drove past me. Across the street from me, I could see a man in dark clothes walking at about the same pace as me. Immediately, I picked up that this person was very suspicious. I walked ahead and quickly turned down a side street that connected to my street. It was not a place many people would visit because it had a footbridge to cross and pretty much everyone that went here would drive down the street. When I saw the man cross by and start to walk the same route, I knew he was following me 100%. I picked up my pace, suddenly realizing I should have waited for him to pass by when he was on the other side of the street. Then I went into my neighbor's driveway to hide so he wouldn't know where I lived. I waited there, hiding in the darkness. 
To my surprise, the guy was ballsy enough to just walk right back there after me. I assumed the motion light would turn on, but unfortunately it seemed the bulb had burned out. I shouted out while still hiding and said something to the extent of, This isn't your street, get the fuck out of here! The man closed the distance and found me and tried to put me into a headlock. I was in complete shock. I didn't know what to do. I began to wildly punch at his head from behind myself and started scratching the hell out of him. I screamed for my neighbor's help, going down the entire list of fire, murderer, kidnapper, everything I could think of to scream when you're in trouble. My neighbor's lights turned on a moment later. I began to scream even louder, ripping myself out of the man's chokehold. I gripped the man's skin and clothing in my fingernails with all the strength I could muster. The man pulled my hands back so hard that it bent my fingernails back. He then tried to jump over the eight-foot-tall fence in the yard before finally finding a hole and disappearing into the trees. My neighbor turned out the light during this time. They never actually came outside, asked how I was, or made any attempt to call 911. I stormed over, banged on the door, and pushed past them into their own home to call the police myself. They kept on insisting they didn't want to get involved in case it was a boyfriend or something. I was clearly being attacked though. I could have been killed right in front of them, and all they could think was it's probably her boyfriend. After I called the police, I went to my house to see where my mom had been during my screams, since we did live right next door. She had been sleeping on the couch and had no idea anything had even happened to me until I kicked her chair to wake her up. Once the police came, they saw the marks on my neck and the grass stains all over my pants. They said they doubted my statement because the canines they'd brought over to sniff the area didn't pick up a disturbance. They also told me to come down to the station for questioning, and when I told them for the millionth time the exact same story without changing anything, they finally said they thought I was telling the truth. Unfortunately, my description was so generic they had to make sure I wasn't lying. Yeah, because lying about being attacked is more important than an attacker being out there potentially. After believing me finally, they had the kindness to let me know someone else had been reportedly attacked nearby and in the exact same way by the same person. Wow, thanks. They wasted all that time when my story matched up perfectly with someone else's anyway. They never contacted me again either to tell me if they caught him, or if he'd attacked someone else again. Who knows, he probably got away if the police care so little about the safety of people, more about covering for their boyfriend or something. I still think about this encounter a lot, even as an adult now. When I was about 10 years old, I'm 25 now for reference, I was downstairs watching TV late at night with my mom and sisters. Everyone had gotten tired and decided to head off to bed, which meant I was left all alone downstairs. I was just starting to drift off, when all of a sudden someone started banging on our door hard. I'm talking desperate, let me the fuck in hard. I was so scared I sat there frozen, staring at the door like my life depended on it. My dog was laying right next to me, and also just stared. He never barked or moved an inch, which was odd because he'd always bark at things like this. The banging continued and didn't stop for what seemed like five solid minutes. I looked over to my dog. I think at this point, because I'd finally moved, my dog snapped out of his trance. He looked at me for a split second, then jumped up and sprinted toward the door. He didn't bark or anything, but instead started turning his head like he was confused. At this point, I got the courage to get up and open the blinds to see what the hell was going on. I was surprised to see a young woman, about 20 to 25 years old, standing there and holding her left breast in her hand. She had blonde hair, white skin, and was covered in blood. Her shirt was ripped open, and her hair was a complete mess. I remember being worried she may have been beaten up, or perhaps in a car crash. Either way, I immediately went to go open the door. As soon as I'd gotten the latch done though, 
my mom out of nowhere slammed her hand back on the door and locked it up in an instant. I had no idea she had even come down the stairs, let alone come up from behind me. I was just so focused on the door and on this woman that when she slammed her hand, it was like it knocked me back into reality. The reality of not opening the door for strangers in the middle of the night. I looked up at her. I could feel my eyes were real wide and I think I may have even started crying. She put her hand on my shoulder and moved me away from the door. My mom called out through and asked who it was. The girl yelled back that her boyfriend had just beaten her up and they lived in the apartments across the street from us. Mind you, we lived in townhouses in a cul-de-sac. Our unit was all the way in the back where you would start the turn. We were the first unit of the row, but where she pointed out that her boyfriend's place was at, it was quite a ways away from us. My mom asked her her name, and she said something I remember even then sounding like it was made up on the spot. I saw my mom hesitate to open the door, but after the girl called out for help desperately once more, she opened it, stepped out, and pulled it closed shut enough to not completely shut it. I cracked the door open behind her to make sure she was okay, and also to see what was going on. The woman, who we'll call Bethany, I suppose, kept on thanking my mom and asking to come in because she was so scared her boyfriend was going to come after her. My mom refused and explained she could not let her inside because of the safety of her four kids. She would sit out there with her if she needed it, though. My mom shouted to grab the phone and call the police, so I did. My mom began to ask her what had happened and what specific unit she lived in. She pointed across to a specific part of the complex and told my mom the building number and her unit was B. All of a sudden, this silver SUV pulled up and she ran towards it, screaming it was her sister. Then she jumped in. The car sped off without another word from her or the sister. My mom looked back at me confused, came back inside and shut and locked the door. We stood there and looked at each other. I asked my mom, what about calling the police? She said she would wait for them downstairs if I wanted to go to bed. I was too scared to leave her though, so I waited there with her. Once they arrived, my mom explained what had happened, and the officer said she'd done the right thing by not letting her inside. The cops explained that they'd been receiving quite a lot of similar calls like that in the area recently. Even worse, the next morning we all packed up to go to the grocery store, and as we passed by the building the girl had pointed out, we could tell immediately the apartment she said she lived at, it was empty. No one had been living there for some time, clearly. I mean, I suppose it's a possibility they just didn't have any furniture or something, but I don't really think that's the case. Never came back after that night, and we never saw her or the SUV in the area again, despite her saying she lived nearby. I hope they're okay if this was real, but if it's not, I hope they never knock on our door again. Who wants to hear about a repressed memory I recovered in therapy? Well, you do, apparently. When I was in sixth grade, I was in the band, you see. I played clarinet, but I wanted to play the saxophone. My grandpa had played the clarinet in the past, though, so that's what it ended up being. The band instructor was this middle-aged woman, who I'm going to refer to as Mrs. Frond. Anyway, I didn't exactly have a lot of friends, so I had a lot of extra lessons after school to replace that. After a while, she started to offer me extra lessons at her house. That made me really uncomfortable, and I refused. She was very persistent though, and would offer at least once a week. Eventually, I stopped going back for extra lessons. Anywho, one day, Miss Fraun announced we had been invited to be in the Christmas parade downtown. That was awesome. The school was literally a year old, so it was great exposure for our band. And best of all, it would be really fun for us kids. We were all so excited to perform. We all had extra rehearsals, and the school made sure we had whatever we needed. All the permission slips were signed, and everything was going perfectly. The day of the parade, we all met up at our designated area. As we got dropped off, though, Miss Fraun told the parents where to pick us up at the end. 
her and some parade officials were the ones watching over us as they left. The parade started and everything was going smoothly, at least so far from my perspective. In fact, it continued to go smoothly. At the very end of the event, everyone else had gotten picked up, and I was the last one left alone with Miss Frond. She grabbed my hand after the last kid was out of sight and told me I could call my mom from her house instead. She didn't even wait for me to respond. She started booking it with me in tow. I had very little experience being on my own, and I didn't know how to react in this kind of situation. Despite the fact I had recently been uncomfortable around her, I allowed her to pull me along. Looking back, it probably didn't look that unusual to anyone else. I had really shot up in sixth grade and she wasn't that tall, so I guess it didn't look like I was being dragged along like I was. I managed to keep up pretty well despite stumbling a bit. I couldn't tell you where in particular she took me, but we were definitely going further out than where everyone else had parked. Her car was now the only one in sight, and she started to beeline towards it. It was one of those dark green SUVs that pretty much everyone had in the late 90s. Suddenly, I began to hear my name being yelled out from behind me. I turned around, only to see my mom panting and sprinting towards us. Miss Franz's grip tightened so hard on my hand that it started to hurt, and she sped up profusely. My mom managed to reach us and yanked me out of Miss Franz's grip. Without a word, she picked me up and ran to her car. We went home, where she proceeded to fawn all over me. That was confusing, because I had pretty much been ignored 99% of the time. I really had no idea what had just happened back then. I never saw Miss Frond in school, or heard anything about her ever again. I don't even know her first name to look her up, and my family never spoke about the incident either. <laughs>